I have run head on into this issue in my life. Yeah. And uh, it's not personal. It has to do with a family member. Yeah. Um, and I've really struggled with it because I don't feel like I want to judge. I don't feel like I want to tell them they're wrong. Right. I just want to love them. Right. And I want to love them well. Um, I don't want to get it wrong. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking for just tidbits of guidance, mm-hmm. ideas, things mm-hmm. I can really sink my teeth into to love this individual and this individual's friends mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. I have mm-hmm. a lot of gay friends. Mm-hmm. And I have gay family members, Mm -hmm. extended family members, and I love them all. This one is particularly close to me, though. It's one of my children. Yeah. And she's remarkable, Mm -hmm. beautiful. Right. And I don't want to change her. I just want to love her. Struggle with whether or not I am even in the right place Mm -hmm. in my heart. Am I really a real Christian, if that's how I feel? You know, I'm just looking for some thoughts along those yeah, lines. Yeah, you know, I think that so many of us are struggling with that question, in part because for, uh, you know, for a season, and I'm not quite sure how long, because I haven't been in the Christian community for, you know, decades and decades, but for, for a season, um, it seemed that saying, thus saith the Lord, solved the problem. Um, and and um, I would say... Falsely, Christian organizations thought that making sneaky little raids into like gay pride marches and things with, you know, with placards of a Bible verse. Well, you know, the word of God will not return void. Let's put this one on a, you know, and and so and I think for many of us though we were for many people who've been raised under that spectrum, it it's a scary question. So let me just offer some of what I think are biblical principles, and and. Um, like so many things in life, you will prayerfully consider where you are in life, you will consult your pastor and elders, and you will make the best decision. <laughs> and then maybe next week you'll make a different decision because it's not all very clear, is it? Um, one thing, though, is that is clear to me. In friendships, people always match the intensity of their love and their relationship with the intensity of their words. And so maybe one thing to think about is, is the balance right? I think that sometimes um, it it struck me as odd in the Christian community, coming from the gay community to the Christian community, that Christians are are very bold about other people's sin. Um, And sometimes the intensity of their words do not match the intensity of their love for the person they're talking about or even their relationship to that person. So one thing to think about is the balance question. Another thing to think about is the the moral framework that God gives us for sin. God calls it deceptive, and that people who are living in sin are deceived. Well, one of the things that is so sad about having a family member who is deceived by sin is you feel like you've lost that person as an interpretive partner as someone you can gather with to make meaning of your world. That is sad. Grieve that loss. Now, that doesn't mean you can't make meaning of anything. There are many things that you can partner with with people who are, who are deceived by a sin and, and, and function. But the big issues in life, no, you can't. And, you know, that is where the loneliness of the Christian life really comes forward. And, you know, one thing that I have wondered as I talk to parents and friends who are grieving their um, gay and lesbian friends and daughters, you know, we have, we have parallel pain. Because do you want to know the biggest fear of somebody who is gay or lesbian? It's the biggest fear. Growing old alone. Being lonely. Being alone. And having people treat you like you're dangerous. And you know the biggest fear that I hear of caregivers, of people who are gay and lesbian? 
growing old without that person, being alone, being misunderstood. Now, isn't that interesting that God has given us a parallel insight? Now, the question is how to make that parallel perpendicular, right? How to kind of cross paths. But you know better than anybody how to pray for people who are trapped in the sin of homosexuality because you're experiencing the same pain. It's called being alone. You know, and that should make us also think about if our church communities are really places where people can be family with us or if we have fallen under you know what 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 I think and and I you know I want to be careful uh, I don't want to offend but I think that we have raised the level of of the covenant of Christian marriage higher than everything and and I think it has just created a very bounded culture in our uh, in our world um, you know it, so I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the way that, you know, so, so often I hear Christians talk about Sunday being family day. You know, actually, it's the Lord's day. That's actually a violation of a pretty important commandment. You know, it sounds really good, though. Um, so, you know, there are ways to even now break down walls that create isolation and loneliness. You know, right, right now, I mean, tomorrow. You could do this tomorrow in your church culture. You could have a different ethos. But you are in pain for the same reason. And, and you know, Jesus is a friend of sufferers. And Jesus is a man of sorrows. And so I think it would be good to ditch some of the unhelpful and unbiblical narratives that we know are in our churches. And we don't mean to do it. We don't mean to do it. But, you know, even our joy in Christ is a bloody joy. It's a different kind of joy. And seasons like this are seasons of grief. And God honors that. And that is redemptive Don't try to fix that. We're to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And, you know, I'm I'm a psalm singer. And so I, um, for me, singing the psalms is is a personally strengthening means of grace. But, you know, singing through those psalms of ascent during pilgrimages of loneliness and danger are a powerful thing. Yeah, because those are God's words spoken to you. And um, it's a powerful thing to know that someone fully understands your suffering and even anticipates it. So two takeaways. Make your words match the intensity of your love in your relationships. And know that that parallel difference needs to become a perpendicular shared sameness. But that when people are in the deceptiveness of sin, they cannot be interpretive partners with you in the deepest things, and that is a terrible loss. You know, my stepfather, who was the smartest man in, in the world, developed Alzheimer's, and, and then he just wasn't there anymore, right? And so for a season, when you are, have friends, loved ones, who are in a season of a covering of sin, it is a deceptive moment, and you don't have that person there in the way you wanted. Does that help? Good question. Over here. Thank you, though, for sharing your um, transparency. How did you meet your husband, and um, how long have you been married? We were married in 2001. Kent and I got married at the same church that he graduated from seminary from the night before. So we were able to rearrange the flowers. (laughs) We had a... Um, a two hundred dollar. I mean, no, seriously. Um, well, I met Kent a couple of ways. Um, the the way that I remember meeting Kent is probably the only way I would ever meet a husband. It was Friday night at a research library. <laughs> and if I, and if any of you have ever like 
if you hung out in research libraries, you know that, especially on the weekends, that the tables are, you know, that's like an empire, you know, and, and if somebody is at your table, that is a, that's almost a warfare transgression, you know. So he was sitting at my table. Go figure. So, um, but, but truly, I had met him and I had known him before, and he said, we, we, had, we had known it was a mutual um, knowledge of each other because I am part of a very small and loving denomination. And so when Ken and Floyd were a bridge to their family and then their church, it was not an act of eruption or departure or, oh no, what do I do now that I need to find a church now that I'm moving? Because our denomination shares um, values and regulative principle of worship, which I know sounds very rule-bounded, but what it, it shares a means of approaching a holy God. And we're small enough that we, we pray for each other and we know each other. And so, although it was not easy, um, and at first it was actually more than not easy. At first it was something I was really offended by. Um, you know, Ken had lots of people praying for me. And you know how those prayer chains go, <laughs> right? So, um, so in some ways... I was known already uh, to Kent. Um, so those prayer chains go another funny way, too. When I was um, in the Moms Club in Virginia, and, uh, you know, had, the book hadn't come out, so I was still very much, you know, just kind of doing my thing. Um, the, the, the husband across the street came over and said, I have to ask this are you the Rosaria who was the lesbian professor at Syracuse? I, you know, and I'm in my apron, and I've got the kid. You know, I ha- because you were on a prayer chain. I was a graduate student. You know, you've know, you know, you got to love the prayer chain. you got to love the prayer chain. But I don't always love the prayer chain, especially when I'm the object. I mean, I need the prayer, but I don't need the you know, spotlight. So. Dr. Butterfield. Oh, thank you. Everyone. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, I, w- I have a question. I teach college students and um, also have a very large group of college students in our church. Mm-hmm. That's great. And for their age group, this is an extremely passionate issue. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that the um, activism on the campuses has done its job. Oh, yes, absolutely. And for them, because the, lang- the civil rights language that's been appropriated, they very much feel that this is a human rights issue. So when I speak with them, um, even to make those distinctions feels like hate to them, mm-hmm. even to make any distinctions about sexuality. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember you saying several times that we don't, we don't use the, we use God's vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So in talking to that generation who is used to Foucault and Freud Mm -hmm. and identities Mm -hmm. and things like that, right? how much do you think for that specific audience, do we appropriate the language that they have been hearing on campuses? Right, right, right. You know, campuses are very complex places, and, and I feel a special burden because, of course, I helped create the world that, you know, that you live in right now. So I, you know, the blood is on my hands, and I recognize that. Uh, and often when I speak on college campuses, and a shorter version of the talk I gave today, I've given at secular college campuses. And you can imagine how just reading Romans 1 in an auditorium at a secular college campus with the protesters, you know, it is a tense... Powerful thing. You know, and I've come to learn that the gospel travels on conflict. You know, in the same way that we were at war with our Savior before he commandeered right, our hearts, having paid the price for our sin, so too 
we will be in conflict. And so the question is, what do I do with this conflict? Um, and what I have been blessed to be able to do so far, and um, each time this has happened for me, is I've been able to sit down with my protesters. And some really amazing things happen when you sit down with people. One of the things that can happen is you can listen. You know, and so often I will just start out and I will say, you've heard me, now you tell me what's on your mind. Because a sign is not enough. <laughs> um, and I, I often learn a lot. Another thing that happens, though, is part of the... Um, maybe it's an aesthetic. Maybe it's a way of doing things as a Christian. You know, aesthetics is the, is the bittersweet beauty in something. And so I, I think of evangelism as a sort of bittersweet beauty. Um, and one of the things that happens also, is you realize that to share the gospel with, with meaning, you have to be close enough to people to get hurt. You don't get to have a little bubble around you. Okay? Signing a ballot doesn't cut it. And then the third part of this aesthetic that, that I've learned is that you cannot take the hand of the deceived, and put it in the hand of the Savior without touching people. All right. So, you know, those are just three things that I have noticed. Now, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty edgy person. You know, and by that, you know, I'm trained in uh, systematic philosophy. I, you know, when people talk to me, even when, you, when I'm in a QA, and a you know, I've only been asked three questions in my whole life of this ministry. And uh, I mean, they're different questions, but they fall into three categories. And so often I'm up here like a triage nurse thinking, okay, you know, where do I route that? You know, because that's how I think. And so, I, I, you know, for me, it's very comfortable. I, it, I, I have a certain comfort level in stopping people and saying, you know what? You can't give a good answer to a bad question. And, you know, as a college student, you know that because you've been complaining all afternoon about the bad questions in your philosophy exam, and you couldn't get it. And, so, and here we are. You can't answer this question because it's the wrong question. So do you want to hear a different question? You know, and then I think you are at the well. I think you are sitting at the well when um, Jesus says to the man who's been sitting there for all those years, you know, do you want to be made well? Well, in the biblical narrative, it seems the answer was yes, okay? But what if the answer was no? You know, what should you do with that person now you've just met at the well? Well, you should sit down with that person and ask some good questions. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and other Christian speakers have talked to me about this too, the, the question of should I answer the question or should I accept the terms and, you know, maybe I'm just a, an old, you know, I am sort of an old Marxist at heart. I just won't. I, we have to not start there. Because if we start there, we will not end up where God wants us. You know, this is a big question. This is not a little question. This is a big question. Um, God, before the foundations of the world, set, up, set apart a people for himself. That is an enormous amount of, um, of loving womb time, okay? That is an enormous commitment. Uh, and so we can't cheapen this by asking the wrong questions. And, you know, God's people are everywhere. And sometimes you also just have to be willing to receive and respect some of the questions that you get. You know, I, I've had someone say to me in a public forum, you know, this is ridiculous. Are you telling me, this is a college student at a, a secular campus, are you telling me that the question I should be asking myself right now is who I am before a holy God and not who I'm having sex with tonight? Now, we should not be squeamish about that. You know what? That was the best question I've heard all day. You, because it was a real question. And it gets you into that paradigm. So 
rather than trying to fix people or wish they weren't the way they are, or wish that the start where they are and reformulate some of those questions. So, you know, one of the things that, um, that Ken said to me early on, and that I use all the time now, he said, well, you know, it seems like we just, we have really competing worldviews, you know, that, um, I, you know, I start with the idea that what is true determines what is valuable and ethical, and what is true is the Bible. And you start with the idea that what is valuable and ethical will determine what's true. We're at different, you know, maybe we should examine this. And, and I, I, you know, brilliant. That was a very helpful, you know, hands-on way of articulating the problem. So before you can, um, I never compete with what, how people feel. Well, I accept how you feel. Of course. How could I not? But the question is, do your feelings mean that God is blessing you? You know, that's a different conversation. So I would take as much time as it takes to not accept terms that are bereft, but um, to recreate better ones. And you can only do that in the intimacy of real relationships with people. Because deeply held beliefs are tied to deeply cherished questions. And people don't give those up easily because they're important. The question is, all right, I had this conversion in a very public way at Syracuse, and I was right in the middle of a, 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 you know, a, a gay and lesbian community, and I was tight, and everybody saw the change, and what happened? You know, what, what happened to those people? Um, and a lot of things happen to a lot of people differently. So I'm just going to say, first of all, just in the general principle to think about, when one person comes to faith in a community that is committed to faithlessness. Um, it is a bloodbath. I had students crying in my office. Um, it is actually harmful to people. If I was directing your dissertation in queer theory, guess what? You've just lost a dissertation director, right? That is serious. That makes you mad, and rightfully so. Um, so... There was a lot of hand-wringing and crying and a sense of betrayal. I betrayed everybody. Think about that. Uh, my, your secrets are no longer safe with me. I might as well have put it on a T-shirt. Um, so that's what happened first. And that is not a small thing. That is not a small thing. Um, and, and then a couple of things happened next. Um, my friend Jay came to church with me. Yes, you say, oh, that's nice. Jay is 6'2", in drag, beautiful bass voice in an a cappella psalm singing church. Awkward. Just say it. Awkward. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the students that... Um, was an international student. I didn't realize that, but when you're a faculty advisor to international students, you're sort of in loco parentis. She had uh, tried to commit suicide. And I got the phone call, and I needed to be there. And um, it became, you know, my support people at this point were my Christian community, but she needed our lesbian community. And so for three weeks in the hospital, we had both. We had my church... And we had the lesbian community in the hospital sharing with each other. May I get you some coffee? Who's on now? And then when she needed to be released, she went to Ken and Floyd's house. Because that was the safest house and everybody knew it. Um, so many things happened. Now, I wasn't there for terribly long. The Lord moved me, you know... And it was very important that he did. He moved me out of Syracuse. I did not lose my job, but I had a research leave, and I went to Geneva College, and so I wasn't there. And that was good, because I needed some time away to just think. And this is before, you know, 
you know, iPhones and things, so I could think. You know, I wasn't constantly being jogged by something, so that was good. But um, for the, the six months that I was there, it was, mer- it was mercy ministry that the Christian community was engaging in as a community. Um, did we see conversions? No, I didn't. Did we serve God? Yes, we did. But it's hard to be trust the person who betrays you. So in some ways, it might seem on the surface like I would be a great witness, but in reality, I was a terrible witness. Does that answer your question? You uh, shared you had a normal childhood. Right. Family, and then right. I was just kind of curious. Um, did you ever experience? Did you ever feel or experience any um, sexual abuse or um, physical abuse yeah. or yeah. Um, emotional neglect from your family that uh, may have maybe cultivated um, or? That's a question. I, I know where you're going with that. that. That's a question that often people ask. Um, does homosexuality result from a kind of brokenness within the family or a transgression, um, you know, a kind of boundary transgression? And, you know, as a, as a mother to foster children, you know, I am amazed at how even young children are sexual targets, I am just, and you know, you, would, you are amazed by it too, how easily pornography slips into the world of a nine-year-old. Um, even a nine-year-old whose parents have covenant eyes, you know, on the main computer. Uh, it, is, it is just startling how, um, how our brokenness, you know, we think we can protect our children and we can't. Um, in... Um, you know, and there, and there, of course, are a number of organizations that will tell you that um, homosexuality is caused by, you know, sexual abuse or a bad relationship with one parent or the other or emotional neglect. And but the problem with those theories is that what do you do with the predominant amount of survivors from dysfunctional homes who are not homosexual? <laughs> you know, what what you know? So it doesn't quite. You know, I think that along the course of anyone's journey, you can look back and say, I see how this informed that. I see how this informed that. But it is not causal. And and, and most of those organizations that claim that it is uh, are often using therapy, a kind of psychotherapy in place of biblical discipling. So... Uh, you know, I, I think I've shared my journey as transparently as, as I can. Um, you know, somebody once asked me, did, you know, being in an all-girl Catholic school, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know that, that's the school I went to. <laughs> um, I, no, I, I don't think that there was anything that happened that made me a lesbian. I think what happened is that the particular thumbprint of original sin for me made pride flourish. And in combination to that, you know, perhaps the fact that I was raised, you know, maybe you want to go there and say, well, you know, you said yesterday that you were raised in a secular feminist household. Okay, I was. But again, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't make necessarily make people gay. Um, but certainly it was my pride that fueled my desire to be sexually autonomous. And if, if, if anything, I think in my past, that might have been a cause of, um, you know, a, a causal or an informing effect, maybe it was the lack of really hearing the gospel. I don't know. I don't know. But here's what I know. Sin lurks in all of us. Original sin lurks in all of us. And it has, it has its own shape and its own size and its own moment, and that's a scary thing. But that's why we want to make sure that we truly are in the means of grace for ourselves and others. Because truly, it is really not another person's sin. I mean, those are terrible things. And as a mother of, of, of foster children, you know, I, it, it's, it's a grievous thing when parents 
or caregivers violate their, their responsibility. But truly in life, it is your sin that will be your, self, your undoing in terms of saving faith. Other people's sin can be very painful, but it is truly your sin, my sin, that is the one that is the killer. Other questions? You have a question. Okay. Thank you for being here. Right here. Okay, right, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in your journey from, because you've talked a lot about that it was pride for yeah. you, um, from that to the way you described your marriage last night as complementarian, mm-hmm. um, just being such a strong and independent woman, yeah. going into, like, what was that transformation? What was that yeah. journey? And yeah. do you still, I, I mean, I can guess the answer to do you still struggle? Yeah. <laughs> Of course, you know, as a pastor's wife who does a good bit of counseling with her husband, I'd say most women struggle with submission. <laughs> I have yet to meet anyone who is just like, oh, this is so great. <laughs> Love this. Um, you know, so um, I talk about that in the book, so it's a kind of a long story. But yes, I would say for me, giving up my feminist worldview was much harder. It was much harder, much more difficult. And... Um, um, you know, dear friends along the course of this journey, though, have said, you know, Rosaria, it's amazing how much you haven't changed. <laughs> you, know, so, so, you know, it's always important, I think, when you're walking the Christian life, if God calls you to marriage, marry the right man. <laughs> um, but, you know, as I said yesterday, Kent and I are, are very good friends. And in part because he is a pastor and we're home a lot together, we have been able to grow together in ways that I think it would have been really hard to do if we got married and then he went to work for 14 hours and you know I kind of saw him you know a few hours a day or something. So we've been able to grow together um, because the gospel has been central to our lives and because you know we just we aren't we aren't sentimental about our sin. You know, I don't know what else to say. It, 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 we're, neither one of us feels any sentimentality about our sin. Also, Kent and I are the only believers in our extended families. And so our, our marriage and our lives have always been um, you know, evangelistic. Our families think we have three heads and we're crazy, you know, <laughs> and tell us that, you know, <laughs> um, loudly at Thanksgiving along with the church family, you know. So it, it, it's just, it's, it's how it is. You know, it's how it is. But I would say this, that I believe that God's design for marriage is absolutely true. See, for me, when I struggle with the pride of wanting to compete with my husband for headship, I realize that I'm struggling with my sin and I'm struggling with my faithlessness. Because if I believed that God was true, I wouldn't struggle quite this much. So I struggle with faithlessness. I still struggle with faithlessness. Um, and I think we all do in, in some of those, you know. You know, having said that, uh, you know, obviously I'm here. You know, I'm here and Kent's home. And yesterday I was here and Kent was teaching a math lesson. So, you know, having talked about headship, part of headship is also sacrificing for your wife to go and do things like this. And so it's a, um, you know, a headship I have learned both through the Bible and also through my marriage is a sacrificial responsibility. I try not to make, can't make too many sacrifices. But, um, but yeah, that was hard. <laughs> that was hard and I write about it. And it's still hard because I'm a sinner. <laughs> um, my question has to do with boundaries and family Mm -hmm. and so Mm -hmm. you're a homeschool mom Mm -hmm. and a wife and incredibly hospitable and then you have a book and you're speaking about your life how do you (laughs) um, balance being present with your children and your husband and um and then also being Rosaria, who has this amazing story. Yeah, and you know, that part... And not letting it encroach in your present life. Right. And then being really respectful of 
who you are as a mom and being present with your children and like how do you practically? Yeah, I do it badly. And you can pray for me on this front because it, it's uh, pretty much every week I'm just ready to pull the plug on this ministry and say I cannot do it. It is way too much. I mean, it's emotionally too much, right? You know, it's not like I'm up here talking about how to knit socks, which I could do. I love to knit socks. In fact, I, I, have, I have this great desire to write my next book on knitting socks, you know, and just realizing that I, you know, it would be so much easier. Um, so it, it, I do it badly. And I, you know, definitely covet your prayers for balance. Um, you know, it helps that Kent is somebody who is very, um, uh, I mean, I think, you know, Kent is just really solid. He's really steady Eddie, and so that helps a lot. Um, and then it also helps, I, you know, I've shared before, I'm a, a Reformed Presbyterian, and we believe in the regulative principle of worship, and one of those aspects is that um, keeping the Lord's Day holy is extremely important. So even though I am apparently on a speaking circuit, I, somebody said that to me, and I said, what are you talking about? And I looked at my calendar, and I thought, oh! How did that happen? Um, you know, I'm always home on the Lord's Day. You know, I, I, the Lord's Day is for worship as a family. And so for me, that day is, is, is a, it's a calibrating day. It's also a foot on the floor day because, you know, I'm a part of a small conservative church and there are people who have no idea what I'm doing, right? You know, I mean, see, you all think, that, you know, there's people who have no idea. Like, oh, you wrote a book, you know? <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, maybe they know that. But, you know, it's just, it's, we're, not, we're not tracking together. So, um, so the Lord's Day is very calibrating because I, you know, it sets the pace, um, you know, for the rest of the week. But, but it is hard, and I mostly feel like pulling the plug on it because, on this ministry, because... Um, you know, as your children get older and you're homeschooling them, as you know, there's more to do. You know, there is just more to do. So if you will pray for me, uh, I have, you know, boundaries are not, are not great. <laughs> I need help. Okay, we've got time for one more question. And you know what, this woman, since you did already ask a question, Wait. there's someone right here. Thank you for having acknowledged that. So, right, was the mic on? Could you hear the question? Okay, the the question was: How do you balance ministering to uh, folks in the LGBT community and protecting your children and and some of those boundary issues? Um, and it was longer and more articulate, but this is what you get. Is that okay? <laughs> is that okay? This is this is sort of the this is kind of the bare bones of it. Um, first of all, I don't think of myself as someone who ministers to the LGBT community any more than I think of myself as somebody who would minister to people in the drug community or the homeless community. I'm ministering to people. And I don't, you know, back to the, you have to ask the right questions. I put zero credence in those identity labels that you seem to love so very much. You know, I, I, I'll respect you and I'll try not to be too snarky about it, but, you know, you are an image bearer of a holy God, and that's how I'm going to look at you, and, and we're going to work from there. So I don't think of my, I don't have a ministry to gay and lesbian people. Um, I just don't. Um, I have friends, um, and of course, because we read through the Bible as, a, as part of our family devotions, you know, my children have always known that I was a lesbian and that I was an atheist, and so, and when Doma, when Doma came out, um, you know, they, they, they understood some of the issues and who in our neighborhood is, you know, what that meant. And, and we talked about it. We talk about it in terms of affinity, not sexuality, for the little ones. The older ones, you know, it's just full, you know, it's full out. We just talk about it. Now, you know, we are also a family who has been licensed foster parents for 10 years. And when you're a licensed foster parent, I want you to know you bring in more issues in your house than you ever do if you are a Christian family being hospitable to the, lesbi <laughs> the middle-class lesbians across the street. <laughs> so you are bringing in real scary stuff. And, and you know, children don't come individually. They come with the people that betrayed them. And so in some ways, I would say we have just cut our teeth on that, you know. And yet, we all see that as our shared context because all of our children came through that. So, you know, we, do, we don't have, we're just not very sentimental, you know, about, about some of those things. Um, now, boundaries come down to this. I took baptismal vows 
for my children. I did not take baptismal vows for my neighbors. And so for me, um, the covenant of baptism is a very helpful way of thinking about my boundaries with people. Um, So there are seasons when we have had to not do much hospitality uh, because we've had um, some real pressing issues uh, at home, and that's fine. You know, that's fine. Does that answer your question? 